Traveler's Tales. It's a company that you may be familiar with. They're the ones who made all of those Lego games that have been pouring onto the shelves in the past couple of years, but before they were glued to the Lego property, they made a lot of other games too. Many platformers, actually. Uh, in fact, they even developed a handful of the post-Naughty Dog Crash Bandicoot games. Amongst these games was a very ambitious project called Haven. Call of the King. This game was supposed to be a huge deal when it came out. Midway, the company that published it, said that it was going to be a brand new kind of game that no one has ever seen before. They even trademarked the term Freeformer as a weird way to try and label this so-called brand new genre. They had the marketing saying that it was going to be like, the next major development in video gaming. It was going to be the first game of a trilogy, but when it came out, it suffered from very poor to mixed critical reception and very poor sales, and as such, all plans for a sequel were completely cancelled. The game was also going to be ported to Xbox and GameCube, with even a Game Boy Advance version on the way, but after the game sold really badly, all those plans fell through. So what exactly happened here? This game was supposed to be this huge, gigantic deal, but it flopped, both critically and commercially. There's a story to be told here that modern ears have yet to hear. I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to get excited, so why don't we pop this boy in and see what exactly Haven was all about. Man, we've got quite the title screen here. The Midway and Traveler's Tales logos are proudly displayed amongst the stars as we slowly pan over to a shot of a spinning planet. And that music, it sounds freaking majestic, like we're about to get ourselves into something magical and amazing. The story begins with Lord Vetch, the supreme evil ruler of the universe. He's enslaved entire races and has conquered many planets. When it comes to Dark Overlords, you don't get much more powerful than Lord Vetch. An informant tells him of a slave named Haven who's been dreaming of something called the Golden Voice. Vetch does not react well to this, explaining that it could be a sign trying to guide Haven to what could ultimately be Vetch's downfall. We then cut to Haven, tinkering in his home with a mechanical bird. We then get one of those, oh, I'm late for work scenarios where Haven jogs off and is late for work and he gets his ass chewed up by his boss right before his robotic bird friend uh, named Talos knocks him over, allowing Haven to run off. It's all very lighthearted, a very uplifting tone. Haven's a very energetic and optimistic character. I, I wasn't expecting the whole slave dynamic to work like this. They all live in peace, you know, so long as they agree to do Vetch's bidding in the mines and whatnot. Not. Haven's a bit of a misfit though, not showing up to his slave work, tinkering in his spare time, and of course, having this recurring dream that worries Fetch so much. Here we're introduced to the first bit of gameplay. Uh, Haven, at its core, is a 3D platforming adventure game. Uh, we've got a standard double jump, you know, accompanied by some very simple platforming. Nothing too ambitious, you just jump on platforms, sometimes they're rotating, nothing too too in depth. Uh, we've also got a yo-yo weapon, which we use as our standard attack. It, it does take some getting used to though. If you use it while running, he does this little slide ahead move, which is good for range, but is bad in certain situations. Uh, for example, it's great for landing hits on enemies that are moving around, but bad if you want to take out something explosive without flying into it. In cases like this, you'll have to use it from a standstill. It's mostly used for these pots here, which serve a pretty big role in the game. You'll find yourself breaking these things all the time, looking for collectibles that you'll need to advance. This is a collectathon game after all, your primary targets being cogs and feathers, uh, but I'll get to those in a bit. Uh, back to the pots, there's many different kinds of them, ones you can smash, ones you'll need a ground pound to break, ones that'll explode and damage you, uh, amongst a handful of others. The blue ones you can actually climb inside and use them to launch yourself up into the air. These ones will also charge your shield energy should you choose to hop out of it without launching yourself. The shield is very useful. It can defend you from projectiles, explosions, just about anything really. Uh, the meter doesn't drain as you use it, but rather with each impact the shield takes, which means you can hold it up as long as you want, but it'll lose its charge after taking damage. Aside from using these pots, you can also recharge the shield by collecting these blue orbs, which are everywhere and anywhere. 
everywhere. The yo-yo is also used for zip lining, which does take some getting used to. Instead of simply being an on-rails thing, you'll have to manually move left and right across the track. If you touch one of the edges, Haven will fall down, often to his death. I hated this at first, until I realized you need to take into consideration the position of the yo-yo rather than Haven's position, so when you're doing one of these sections, you gotta stare at the yo-yo and think about controlling it instead of looking at Haven and thinking about controlling him. Once I had that figured out, these sections were a piece of cake. So soon on into the story, we encounter Haven's best friend Chess being hassled by a guard. After trying to save her, we get knocked out by some falling rocks, and while unconscious, Haven has the dream of the tower again before waking up to a doctor giving him treatment. <laughs> Not to let you back to work until, until, until you feel better. Oh my god. Am, am I supposed to take this voice acting seriously? What the hell is this? I, I can barely even understand the guy. I should be up Mr. Pondberry's attending to his boils. <laughs> but uh, I'll look at you again tomorrow. <laughs> Bye. Good lord, that's bad. Uh, this seems to be a recurring thing in this game. The various NPCs having god-awful voice actors. I, I really don't know what they were thinking. This is befuddling, honestly. It's not so much that the voice actors are bad at voice acting, it's more so that the directors were like, yeah, just do a voice that's really irritating and impossible to understand. I don't... I don't... Why? At least Haven's voice is fine. He delivers his lines well enough. It's nothing Oscar winning, of course, but it's easy on the ears and it gets the job done. Not a chance. Nobody saw a thing. Though his lines for when he collects something sounds a lot more like he's remembering something good rather than a shout of triumph. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! There's still some pizza left! Anyway, Haven learns that Chess was arrested to be taken into questioning about Haven's recurring dream. Knowing that this dream must mean enough to Vetch to have his best friend taken in for questioning, he figures it must really mean something after all, and based on that, he sets out on a journey to discover the meaning of this tower in his dreams. So far, I think the story's been fairly interesting. I mean, it had a decent setup, and things have been fairly well paced out so far. So far. That's the problem. Things are about to start getting a little bumpy. Haven is a completely linear adventure game. During your journey, you'll go from one area to the next, completing a series of objectives to gain access to the next stage. Each level early on usually takes shape of a village, but oftentimes you'll find yourself in mines, caverns, temples, and other settings as the game goes on. In every level, you'll have a list of goals to complete before you can reach the next chapter of the story. The main goal is often helping a character in return of transportation, like this sailor here. He needs you to prepare his ship. In order to do this, you'll always have to collect a certain amount of cogs to power some device to advance and often collect five feathers to call Talos, getting him to perform some action for you. This can range from using him as a jetpack to douse fires in a village, picking you up and moving you to another location, or performing an action that meets the goal directly. Each level is fairly open-ended. They're not gigantic, but they're still fairly sizable and you're free to explore it entirely on your own. I actually really, really like this. Every level has enough set pieces to familiarize yourself with your surroundings so you don't get lost, and exploring around for all the cogs and feathers is a fairly good time. I actually really like this. It's a straight-up collect-a-thon platformer game, like Banjo or Mario. But this isn't always how the game plays. Between platforming sections are a wide array of different vehicle segments that all have their own very unique play styles. This is how they try to shoehorn in a bunch of different genres, which in turn is partially what made this game such an ambitious project. I guess we'll start with the car levels. You drive this big ass truck thing around the map. Your goal? Take a wild guess. You gotta collect a bunch of cogs, except this time you're exploring a really bland map instead of something interesting like a village or a temple. They even straight up just show you where they are on the mini-map. You just kind of drive over to them and pick them up. Sometimes you'll have to take out enemy vehicles, which honestly is a chore because you have to chase down these power-ups that fly away from you to do it. It's very tedious. There's also boat segments that play more or less the same, except you're on water instead of on land. You might be collecting cogs, you might be in a race. Either way, it's not too much different from the car parts. There's also a hang 
glider bit where you have to fly through these rings, but it's so disjointed. I kept screwing up because I didn't know which way to go and I kept running out of momentum and crashing. These segments really needed better level design and placement of the rings that was easier to follow. But the worst of it are the turret segments. Yes, you heard me right. Again, turret segments in a platformer. Who wants this? And the worst part is there's so many of them and some of them can last a really long time. The worst one is when you're riding a boat and you're defending it from pirate ships. It's so freaking stressful. You have to simultaneously take out the ships and shoot down all the missiles and cannonballs and drones and mines and everything they fire back at you. It's so hard to try and concentrate on taking out these ships just so you can advance past this level when you also have to shoot down all this other crap too just so you don't end up dead. But the absolute worst part about this particular turret section is that it took me over 30 minutes to complete. I'm not exaggerating. When I finished this stage, I looked over at my game capture program and the timer read 32 minutes. I've criticized platforming games for having turret segments in the past, I mean most notably Rayman 3 and Scalar, but I don't think those games even come close to holding a candle to how bad the ones in Haven are. I suppose the controls in Haven are a little bit better than those two games, but even still, it's remarkably stressful, extremely tedious, and very not fun at all. I mean, who actually wants to play a turret segment in a platforming game? That's just absurd. But even worse, can you imagine doing that for a half an hour straight? I think that speaks for itself. And it's not just these other genre segments that are the game's low points. There are a handful of sections in the game's main platforming genre that are pretty bad for it too. Some things just come absolutely out of freaking nowhere. I mean, look here, you enter this elevator and guess what? Gladiator battle! Wh what? O okay, suddenly we need to destroy all these huge waves of enemies for like 10 minutes straight? What? This part also frustrated me, though nowhere as much as the turret segment. For parts battling against large amounts of enemies, you often get these laser power-ups. There's a bunch of them for some reason. A kinda rapid fire one, a rapid fire one, a really rapid fire one, a spread one, explodey one. Th there's so many of them and there really doesn't need to be. I find some are more effective than others, but I guess it's really down to preference. These power-ups are always just laying around, so pick up whichever one you like best and blast away, I guess. Other sections put you in a super monkey ball situation where you have your shield wrap around you in a sphere and you'll have to run along an obstacle course. So these ones aren't too bad. The control could be a little better, but what really gets me is the need to continually collect the blue spheres or your shield runs out and you fall to your death. It adds a level of stress that didn't really need to be there. Speaking of collecting things, there's these really weird orange orb things everywhere and I've been collecting them the entire game, but I have no idea what they're for or what they do and it seems like I keep running out of them as well. What, what are these? You know what, why don't we look in the instruction manual? I mean, how often do you get to do that? Well, they got like a little advertisement for Dr. Muto in the back. That's funny, because that game was midway too, but anyway, uh, where do we have it here? Katana, Vetch has poisoned Haven and all of his people with a life-draining virus. Doses of antidote, Katana, can be found all over the solar system. Haven must continually replenish his supply or he'll become too sick to continue. What? what? Everyone's poisoned. When did that happen? Did I miss that? Or did the game not tell me? That's That sounds like a pretty big plot thing. You'd think I would have known that, though. I guess, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if I missed it because the voice acting sounds like... Take care of you. But yeah, I guess that's how Vetch keeps all of his slave people in line, by poisoning them and not giving them the antidote if they don't work. Wait, no. It said the antidote was naturally occurring. I don't know, this don't, I don't, something like that. This don't make no sense. I don't know. <laughs> so I guess these orbs are some sort of antidote and you have to collect them constantly if you want to stay alive. I guess think of it like Mario's health meter, constantly draining as if you're underwater. You'd have to constantly collect coins. While it sounds high stress, it really isn't. I mean, you can hold a lot of these things and it drains fairly slowly too. Not to mention, not only are they absolutely freaking everywhere, but they respawn really quickly too. I guess it was thrown in there as a narrative device, which is a cool idea, I guess. I mean, you know, using gameplay mechanics to deliver on some of the story or some of the lore, uh, it, it can work. Whether it does in this game, well, 
not really. I don't know. It's it's all it's all right, I guess. I'm just glad they have it in here in a fairly non-intrusive way. Except during that pirate ship turret part. That that that's the only part it really became a problem. I had to keep leaving the turret to collect more of these things, making that section even worse than it already was. As the game goes on, the story gets pretty freaking grim. There's themes of betrayal and trying to understand forces beyond your human comprehension. However, the tone just doesn't feel right the whole time because of how goddamn joyous Haven is. He's so happy about everything, and everything seems to make him smile. He'll be listening to someone explain something, and he just gives them this stupid smile like, Oh, oh yeah, okay, alright, uh-huh. Uh-huh, alright, okay. I mean, I'm all for the ambitious and optimistic hero, but come on, dude, you you need to settle down. I'm also really not a fan of how this game looks. I mean, the environments look okay, but the way the characters are modeled is this gross middle ground between realistic and cartoony. I mean, check him out on the front cover. This is how I wish he looked in-game. I mean, I don't, I don't hate his character design or anything, I just hate the in-game models. And it's not like you couldn't have a realistic art style on the PS2, I mean, look at Metal Gear Solid, the Splinter Cell games, 007, all these games have a primitive yet realistic art style that worked well for its time, so I really don't see why they couldn't have done it in this game here. I mean, why have that art style on the front cover if it doesn't accurately represent the game? Oh, uh, they also tried to render the actual teeth inside everyone's mouths too, and while, yeah, they went the extra mile to render each individual tooth on every character, it just doesn't look good. I mean, you just get these gross looking pieces is two teeth. PS Tooth. Though for 2002, there is some impressive detail here. I mean, this can range from the nice little touches like how Haven puts up his hood when it starts to rain to scaling that would have been pretty freaking mind blowing at the time. Midway through the game, you find a holographic map of another planet and you need to find where on it lies the tower from Haven's dream. You can zoom all the way into this planet and the detail grows accordingly. This is crazy for a game this early. And on top of that, later in the game you start piloting a spaceship to go to different planets and you get to see in one uninterrupted take the entire view of the planet from outer space all the way down to the ground and the textures update and refresh and make it look really smooth. Lo no low times or anything. This is just one go. This is crazy. I I'm actually really impressed. If I have to give this game props for one thing, it's definitely the sense of scale here. I've never had a PS2 game make me feel this. It's rad as hell. The ship segments themselves are actually pretty fun. It's probably the one vehicle segment I actually somewhat like. It's similar to the dogfighting in Star Fox, you know, doing rolls dodging ships, tailing them around, bop, 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 bop. I, I actually make those noises when I play the game. It's just a lot of fun, especially if you're a fan of Star Fox. However, the segments do get very repetitive. I mean, every time you want to journey to a different planet, you have to take out the exact same waves of enemy ships each and every time. You have to do these same segments over and over, like, okay, uh, take out these ships, power up, shh, out into the atmosphere. Okay, now I gotta take out these ships. You have to do this every single time, and it can take up to 15 minutes, too. It repeats over and over, and it really started to test my patience. By the end of the game, the story is pretty freaking elaborate, but if there's any one thing this game is absolutely notorious for, it's the ending. I guess spoilers from here on. Uh, skip here if you don't want to see the ending, but I recommend you don't skip. I recommend you watch the ending with me. I recommend you see what I gotta say about it, because it's ridiculous, and you guys need to see it. So Haven arrives at the tower and rings the bell, you know, just like in his dream, but nothing seems to happen. He then gets a distress call from Chess, and in going to save her, it turns out that Chess has betrayed Haven in order to turn him over to Vetch. She didn't believe in Haven's dream and thought it would be best for their people to put a stop to Haven's actions before they cause any more harm. Before Vetch can kill Haven, Athelion arrives and offers to surrender to Vetch in exchange for Haven's life. Name dropping Athelion like he's a nobody, I mean, that's how they introduce him into the scene. Athelion's supposed to be this legendary fabled king that like tried to stand up against Vetch and has been in hiding for over a thousand years, but here he just kind of walks on camera out of nowhere. After only being really mentioned like once in the entire game, I feel like they should have built up to that a little better. 
Vetch takes off with Athelion to the tower. Haven then gives chase only to bear witness to Athelion being executed at the tower. Haven then attacks Vetch, which is played out in a quick time event battle? What? What? When did this turn into the Indigo Prophecy? Okay, whatever. Vetch then ends up having Haven chained down. However, the power of the tower keeps Haven immortal, and unable to kill Haven, Vetch leaves the planet, leaving Haven to be chained by the tower for all eternity. Credits. Wow. That... I don't know what to say. That is one hell of a cliffhanger ending, I can say that much, good lord. The game itself was actually stated to be a sort of Christian allegory by the developers, you know, I guess Haven being strapped up to the boulder at the end, representing the crucifixion of Christ himself, and I think there were supposed to be further biblical elements explored, uh, but you know, the trilogy never happened, so in turn that never happened either, but uh, best part? That's not it. There's a little more after the credits. If you 100% the game, you're rewarded with a little bit extra. At the very end, the game completely opens up and you're free to visit whichever planet you want. You can return to grab any collectibles you've missed, but 100%ing the game is not easy. You need to collect these 12 rune stones that are hidden all across the universe, so they're pretty freaking hard to find. And once you get that, you have to find these eight hidden temples, which can be hidden any anywhere on any planet, so again, very hard to find. And once you have all those, you have to get the eight black diamonds. And once you have all those, you can view the true ending. Okay, so to better elaborate on what it is exactly you have to do, you need to first collect the game's 12 runes. Uh, these are all hidden within the game's actual stages. A select few are obtained by replaying some of the mini games, but the vast majority are found by searching for five very well hidden keys in a stage and then using them to unlock the hidden rune pot. Once you've got all 12 runes, you can then return to the open world segment of the game and search each planet's surface for a giant rune printed on the ground. Approaching this will have a tower from the ground, allowing you to land your ship inside of it. There's eight of these towers total, each one containing a special challenge stage. Most of them are just those shield roller stages, but there's also some hang glider stages and one last gladiator battle. These are ridiculously hard, the shield ones especially. It's super monkey ball hell mode, dude. And don't, don't even get me started about how mad I was getting at the gladiator battle. Some of these took me up to half an hour of just trying over and over again because they were just so freaking difficult. But really, the worst part of this entire quest is finding the towers themselves. They can be anywhere on the entire planet, and while the game does tell you which planets do have towers left to find, it does not tell you or give any indication whatsoever of where specifically these towers could be. So, you know what that means, right? It means exploring the surface of each planet for literally hours until you can find one. It's probably the most tedious thing I've ever gone through, not just in video games, but in my entire life. And to make matters worse, not only is your ship incredibly slow, but you're continuously being hunted down by enemy ships, and if one manages to crash into you, it's an instant death, which will boot you back to the planet's starting point. But yeah, completing each tower will show you another one of those holographic maps that shows you where one of the eight black diamonds are. I have no idea what the significance of these diamonds are. I mean, in fact, there's absolutely nothing in the entire game telling you about the very existence of this quest, let alone the black diamonds. And that is very strange, considering the amount of effort into the mere scale of this part of the game. Why go through so much effort to create this incredibly impressive system if it's entirely optional? You know, I think Haven is a great example of how impressive scale does not necessarily mean a good game. I mean, you gotta remember when everyone got really hyped up for No Man's Sky, based purely on the game's impressive scale. You can have the biggest world you want, the biggest universe you want, but if exploring that universe is not fun, then there just isn't much point now, is there? This is such a time-consuming process, and I don't even really know how doable it even is without a walkthrough, especially back in 2002 when walkthroughs weren't so readily available, and I highly doubt that any companies printed a physical guidebook for it, though that would be pretty sick actually, but anyway, if you manage to do all of this and you beat the game again and you see the extra extra ending after the credits, it's just a wide shot circling this golden city that I think Athelion's from or whatever, and you just get this flavor text that's like, thank you for 100%ing Haven, uh, uh, Vetch is out there, he's going to enslave the universe, who will stop him? Uh, why did Chess betray, uh, Haven? Will she ever see him again? Will Haven escape? Will Haven get to the golden city? What lies for him there? And then the real kicker. 
Any questions, thoughts, or suggestions, email us at haven at ttails.com. I'm not making this up. Email us. Your reward for 100%ing the game is their email. Email us. In the end, Haven was one hell of an ambitious game that was unfortunately ill-fated from the very beginning. The platforming sections are fun and the game is very impressive here and there, but so many segments of the game range from boring to frustrating. And that's what happens when you try to focus on so many different types of gameplay. You get this unfocused mess of a game that doesn't really shine in any one particular area. I've said this before, but I don't think it applies to any other game as well as this one. A jack of all trades is a master of none, and Haven is a perfect example of that. It's not a thoroughly terrible game, just a game with a couple of strong points and a lot of very weak points, but I am glad I experienced it. The legacy behind this game is an odyssey in itself. I mean, the director himself, John Burton, stated that this game was a very personal project to him. Well, I'm sorry it didn't work out so well, John, but I hope you learn from your mistakes. I mean, ambition can lead to some fantastic things, but without focus, ambition can be messy.